Shabbat Shalom and Chodesh Tov to all of you. We're in the month of Av, so I wish that uh, this first part of the month will go past quickly and that we will be able to have a wonderful and joyful month for the rest of the time after we go through the ninth of Av. Today is also a special Sabbath this week. It's called Shabbat Chazon, and the word Chazon means vision. The reason why we call this coming Sabbath Shabbat Chazon is because of the Haftarah that we read on the day. Remember, we've been reading these three Haftarahs about the destruction of the temple and the exile of our people for the last three weeks during the three weeks of mourning. Uh, this week is the last one. We will read the uh, vision that Isaiah had about uh, had about the destruction of the temple and the exile of the people. And that's why this week is called Shabbat Chazon. But in saying that, we are in the year 2020. And I want to see that we have 2020 vision for this year. Because I think with what's going on in the world right now, we have actually a stronger vision than ever before of how much this world needs redemption. How much we need Yeshua to return and that temple to be rebuilt. So I hope that this Shabbat, Shabbat Chazon, will be meaningful to all of you and that you'll really be able to connect with that vision of what we really need. We need the Messiah to return, to come now, so that we can witness the redemption. So in this week's parasha, we start the fifth and final book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, or in Hebrew it's called Devarim, uh, which is Moses' recap of what happened to the generation of the wilderness and throughout the Torah before the new generation enters into the promised land. He reminds them of the shortcomings and the failures of their parents, but he also jumps ahead, skipping the whole 38 years of the book of Numbers, and he jumps ahead to their most recent victories over some of the mighty kings to encourage this new generation as they're about to enter into the land. So the book of Deuteronomy is kind of like Moses standing in front of the nation and making a covenant renewal with them. Saying that, you know, God took us out of Egypt, just like he promised our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, took us to Mount Sinai, and we made a covenant there, the Sinai covenant, but that generation has now passed away, so let's renew that agreement, let's renew that covenant to obey God's commandment before you guys enter into the land. And why does he do that? Because if we are keeping God's commandments, the Torah tells us that you will live a life filled with blessing. Whereas if you're not following God's commandments, you are unfortunately choosing for yourself a life of curses. And that is a summary of the entire book of Deuteronomy. Either keep God's commandments and be blessed, or don't keep God's commandments and be cursed. And you know, reading the book of Deuteronomy is probably the most effective book for us to read out of the entire Torah. Because what Moses is doing, you know, you might be asking the question, why do we every year study the same part of the Bible, every week the same part of the Bible? Well, it's for the same reason that Moses repeats the entire Bible, in uh, the entire Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy. Because it's there for us to look back at what happened and learn a lesson for life today. Look at the examples of what God did with the nation of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt, and see that you don't make the same mistakes that generation did today. So this week, I want to look at all things big and small in this week's parasha and see what lesson we can learn for life today. Just as Moses was preparing that nation before they entered the land, every week when we study these parashas, we are trying to learn a lesson before we enter the Messianic era. So the book of Deuteronomy starts off with this long rebuke. In fact, for the next three weeks, we're going to be reading about this rebuke. And Moses is rebuking the people of Israel uh, up until we get to parashat Re'eh. And uh, during this rebuking, the main thing that he rebukes the people for, obviously one of the biggest sins that they committed when we were in the wilderness, was the bad report, the evil report brought back by the spies after they went into the land of Canaan. And uh, the result of this bad report of the 12 spies was that that generation was doomed to die and be buried, uh, buried in the desert. They weren't allowed to enter the, the land of Israel. And anyone want to guess which day of the year this bad report came back? We know. It's the 9th of Av, the 9th of Av, which is occurring this week, right? On Wednesday night begins the 9th of Av, and we fast for 24 hours, a dry fast. No water, no food, no nothing, no happiness, no smiling, no jokes. The whole 9th of Av, we're fasting for 24 hours because it is the day that the spies brought back this evil report. And then also, over history, it's become the worst day in our, our history. It's the day that both the first and second temple were destroyed, amongst other horrible things that have happened throughout history. Right, So it was on that day that they brought back the bad report. 
Now, we've already studied the story of the 12 spies this year, right? Not so long ago in the book of Numbers, Parashat Shalach Lecha, we spoke about the 12 spies. Today, I want to look at the story again and see what the cause is for the people's rejection of the land and what it is that caused them to fear the land and how we can learn from this to overcome our own fears as well. Okay, so you remember from that portion when we studied in the book of Numbers that uh, the spies that came back said to Moses and to the people of Israel, they said, we look like grasshoppers in the eyes of those giants in the land of Canaan. And when the spies brought back the fruit from the land of Israel, this massive grapes and the massive figs and the massive pomegranates, instead of saying, oh, look at the wonderful bounty of this promised land we're entering, instead of saying that, what did they say? If this is the size of the fruit, can you imagine the size of the people? Right? And they went like this all over the place. And everyone got angry. You know, every time I read about the, the size of those grapes and the size of the fruit they brought back from Israel, I always think about that movie that, the, that we watched, that cartoon movie as a child. Uh, I think it was called James and the Giant Peach. That had this massive peach that the guy lived in. It reminds me of that. But anyway, think about it. Seeing giants in the land that you were supposed to go and move into, that is an understandable fear. Can you imagine having to go and invade a place of people that are so much bigger than you? I remember when I was a child, when I, when I was in school, I used to play cricket. And uh, whenever we'd go to cricket to play against the other schools, there was once or twice that we'd go out into the farmland areas. And they would have to play against the kids that grow up on farms. And, you know, when they walk onto that cricket pitch, these guys are twice the size of us. And they were the same age, right? They obviously get fed something different on the farms. And as soon as you see these giants walking onto the field, you know that ball is going to hit you straight in the face and you start trembling and getting scared. The fear that these guys brought back, you know, it's an understandable fear that we're going to enter this land and we're supposed to fight wars against all these guys, but they are giants. They are so much bigger than us. But Moses knew that this was a concern and therefore in this week's parasha, Moses puts the new generation at ease by reminding them of how God just recently helped them defeat other mighty nations around Canaan on their way in. They just defeated the mighty Sichon, king of the Amorites. And not just him, they just defeated a giant, Og, king of Bashan. Now, Og is a name, you know, he's a weird character in the Bible. Um, because the name Og appears way back earlier in the book of Genesis, before the flood even, as one of the descendants of the Nephilim, these giants. But his name appears again in this week's parasha. So there's a few Midrashim that say it's the exact same guy. But then obviously you have to answer the question, well, how did he survive the flood? We were told it's only Noah's family that survived the flood. So there's a Midrash that says he, what he did was he hung on to the back of the ark. I don't know if he was on, on a tube going like this or if he was wakeboarding or what he was doing. But he hung on to the back of the ark and I'm guessing he fed himself by fishing for those uh, 40 days and 40 nights where the flood was happening. So apparently this guy survived the flood and he was still alive today. And he was at this time the king of Bashan. But the Torah tells us that in this week's parasha, this old character was defeated by the Israelites. Right? And that's a wonderful thing. That someone so big, someone so powerful, who has, you know, apparently survived the flood, tried to come and destroy Israel in this week's parasha. But Moses reminds them that they even overcame Og, king of Bashan. They were giant slayers, way before King David ever had a sniff of Goliath. And, you know, the previous generation, they had this mentality, this paradigm, that their problems were bigger than God. But Moses is telling this generation, this new generation, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Because nothing is bigger than God. And how do you want to know that you're staying in God's favor? Let me tell you the book of Deuteronomy. Keep the Torah and you will be blessed. And to drive this idea home of how they can overcome giants, Moses goes and tells them just exactly how big this giant's bed was. It tells us that Og's bed was made out of uh, steel or iron. Because when he would come home from school and jump on his, uh, you know, fall down on his wooden bed, they would break it off. So they had to build him an iron bed, this massive thing they had to go sleep on. This was the original king size bed, by the way. Okay, so it's no secret, right? Giants are a scary thing, something you would think you should be afraid of. But Moses is teaching us in this week's parasha not to be afraid of even giants, because if we're living in God's favor, 
we can overcome any obstacle of any size, no matter what it is. God has and He will perform miracles for us so that we ourselves can be called slayers of giants. So it's a great miracle that they defeated giant, this giant orc and all the other giants that were in the land of Canaan. But what, let me ask you this question, what would be an even greater miracle than the small nation of Israel defeating giants? How about a nation of midgets, dwarfs? How about a nation of dwarfs defeating a nation of giants? Check this out. The Torah actually tells us about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 23, it tells us about a nation known as the Kaftorim. Who are the Kaftorim? So I'm drawing here for a commentator known as the Chida. The Chida draws upon the Midrash, the Yalkut Shimoni, saying that the Kaftorim from Kaftor are a nation of midgets. Not just any midgets, though. He points out that these are midgets who married other midgets. And he quotes from the Talmud, from tractate uh, the Chorus 45b, that it says, when a midget marries another midget and has a child, that child is even smaller than the midget parents. And he says, this was the nation of the Kafturim. They were mini-me midgets. Yet, the Torah is telling us in this week's parasha about the nation of Kafturim. And what does it tell us? It tells us that they defeated the nation of uh, the Avim, who according to our commentators were a nation of giants. Can you believe that? An army of mini-me midgets defeated an army of giants. This is the ultimate underdog story. So why is Moses telling them about that? What does that have to do with their conquest of the land? Moses is showing them that they don't need to fear anybody else, but at the same time, they need to see themselves in a good light and believe in themselves. You know, when the 12 spies came back with a bad report, they said that the inhabitants of Canaan were giants, and they looked at us as if we were grasshoppers. But they said something about themselves as well. They said, this is a direct quote from that parasha Shalach Lecha. They said, to ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers by comparison. And we looked like that to them too. So they're saying that their own view of themselves was that we knew we looked like grasshoppers. And those giants knew we looked like grasshoppers to them too. They had a, an issue with how they viewed themselves. It's known as the grasshopper effect. Right? So there's a joke about this, right? Uh, two Jews, old Moishele and Dovid, they're walking down the road one night in the darkness, and they notice that out of the alley jump two thugs and start following them. So Moishe looks over to Dovid and says, Dovid, we're in real trouble. We've got to get out of here quick. And Dovid says, why? He says, can't you see? Can't you count? There's two of them, and we're alone. You see, that's the problem. This is the grasshopper effect, that you don't believe in yourself. Right? And this was the problem with the generation of the spies. They didn't have a good view of themselves. They saw themselves as grasshoppers in comparison to the giants of the land of Canaan. Now, you can't do much about other people's perception of you. If you look like a grasshopper to them, you look like a grasshopper to them. You can't change that. But what you can change, what's within your control, is your perception of yourself. They said, we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. And they realize that we are like grasshoppers too. And I think that is why Moses is bringing up uh, this point of the kafterim, the midgets, in this week's parasha. To show that even if, an army of, even if you're an army of dwarves, you can still conquer an army of giants. Do you think that that army of dwarves, the kafterim, do you think that they saw themselves as grasshoppers? When they were attacking the giants? No. I, I, I imagine they were like a Jack Russell attacking a Labrador. Someone who doesn't know his own size. So the Talmud tells us an interesting thing. It's from Tractate Sota 35a. It tells us why they specifically thought they were grasshoppers. They heard this directly from the giants. So while the 12 spies were spying out the land of Canaan and going to all the different uh, cities and the towns, as they would approach a town, secretly spying, and they would see the giants spot them from a distance and come out to meet them, they would quickly jump into the trees and sit like this. And the one giant would say to the other giant, 
What I see looks like men the size of grasshoppers sitting in the trees. And the other giant would say to him, oh, you've had too much schnapps today. Get your eyes checked. Let's go back. Right? So the spies would do this when they entered the land and tried to spy out all the cities. They would jump into the trees. And that's why they would look like grasshoppers. That's why they believed that, uh, you know, the, the question is, how do they know the giants saw, thought they were grasshoppers? Because they overheard the giant saying, it looks like grasshoppers sitting in the trees. So that's, the Talmud tells us that's the story of uh, why specifically they chose grasshoppers. And this got me thinking. There's another story in the gospel where a very short little pickening guy jumps into a tree. You know what I'm talking about? Zacchaeus. Yes, Zacchaeus. There's a famous song about him. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. For the Lord he wanted to see. Right? It's a children's church song. So what do we know about Zacchaeus? Okay, so Zacchaeus was, of course, also a short person. But Zacchaeus was a person that was absolutely hated by his community there in Jericho. Why did they hate him so much? Because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He worked for Sars. And he was corrupt on top of that. He worked for the wicked King Herod. And everyone considered him a traitor to the Jews. That is why they were so shocked when Yeshua walked past the tree and plucked him down and said, Hey, you, I'm coming to your house tonight. This is the Messiah. This is this great rabbi coming to your town. All the, you know, the, the, the cream of the crop of the community wanted him to come to their home. Right? The great rabbis, the, the learned Pharisees. And instead, what does he do? He picks this little tax collector that's so short you can't even see over the crowd. And he has to climb a tree just to see what's happening. And they were angry about this, right? But yet, in the story of Zacchaeus, what happens to Zacchaeus? He becomes what we call a Baal Teshuvah. He is a complete repentant. So much so, that he pays back everyone that he's wronged. And yet, after that, he still gives half of all of his wealth to the poor. It's an amazing story of uh, what Yeshua did. Because, you know, Zacchaeus, he's, he encompasses exactly what Yeshua said his mission was when he came here that first time. Which was, he came for the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. He didn't come for the healthy and those that are righteous. He came for the lost sheep, the sinners, the tax collectors, so that he could turn them around so that they would repent because the message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I want to quickly look at what happens in Zacchaeus's house that afternoon or that evening because Yeshua sits with his disciples around Zacchaeus's dinner table and he gives them a parable. Uh, you might say it's two parables. It's like two parables woven into one. So I want to look at these parables quickly because these parables fall under a category of parables known as journey parables where there's always a, a king or a master or a husband who has to go away on a journey or a father who has to go away on a journey and leaves those behind in charge of looking after either the crops or the business or something he gives them and says you guys got to do something with us while, I while I'm away and when I return I will see my return on investment, what you've done with that treasure that I've given to you. For example, the story of the ten virgins, right? They had to stay awake and prepare for the return of the, the Messiah, of uh, whoever's going to come back. Or the parable of the shopkeeper, who has to come back and see that they did something with the shop while he was away. So here's the two parables that Yeshua gives in Zacchaeus' house to his disciples when they witness this repentance and this return of Zacchaeus. So in the first, and by the way, now that I've mentioned that, this journey parables is exactly what Moses is doing in the book of Deuteronomy. It's his final speech. God told him, go up to the mountain, you'll be gathered to your people. So what does Moses do? He gives them a journey parable. He says, I'm going to go on a journey. While I'm gone, here is your treasure, the Torah. Do what God says and be blessed, or don't do what he says and be cursed. And when I return, well, not literally Moses, but the second Moses, he calls the Deuteronomy prophet like unto Moses. When that prophet returns to see what you've done with the Torah, make sure that you will be rewarded with blessings. Okay, so it's the exact same thing going on there. So here's the two parables that Yeshua gives. The first parable talks about a king who goes away on a journey and gives his servants each ten manes. Which, uh, if you want to talk about in relative terms, uh, I'm not sure. Let's just say he gives each one of his uh, workers 10 grand, right? He obviously got this from the Terz Fund. He gives each one of the workers 10 grand and he says to them, 
do business with this 10 manes while I am away and I will see what happens when I return. It's very similar to the parable of the 10 talents that we read about in the book of Matthew, right? But this one is in the book of Luke. So what happens? He returns and he goes to three of his servants to see what they did with the 10 money. To the first servant, he goes and he says, Ah, oh, master, I took your 10 monies and I made another 10 monies. So the king rewards him and he says, Ah, oh, your reward is that you will now be in charge of 10 cities. He goes to the next one and the next one says, Ah, oh, I took your 10 monies and I made another 5 monies. And he says, Ah, oh, great, your reward will be that you get 5 cities or 5 towns to look after that you'll be in charge of. And then he goes to the third servant and the third servant says, I kept your monies, I didn't lose them, yeah, have them back. Didn't do anything with it. And this servant is referred to as the wicked servant because he didn't do anything with that treasure that the king, that the master gave him. And he actually says to that servant, anyone who has something will be given more. And anyone who has nothing, even when he does, what he does have, will be taken away. Right? So if you're entrusted with a little, at least do something with it little and you'll be rewarded to have more. But if you're entrusted with something and you do nothing with it, then that will completely be taken away and everything you already have will be taken away as well. That's the first parable. Right? The second parable that also weaves into this one uh, talks about a nobleman of a town who goes away to the big city where he is going to be crowned as king of this town. But while he's on his way, the other countrymen from his little town decide, we don't want that guy as our king, we don't like him. So they send their own delegation to their town as well to tell them, hey, we don't want this guy as our king. But eventually, the guy gets uh, crowned as king of the town and he returns to this town. And when he gets there, he says to the people, bring me those that don't want me as their king because they are enemies of mine and he has them slaughtered. That is the second parable. And you know, in these two parables, I think it's a very timely time to study these two parables because to me it gives an explanation of why God took away the temple on the ninth of Av. Because the reason that God gave us the temple, gave us the tabernacle in the first place was so that I may dwell among you. God wanted to live among us. That was the point of the tabernacle in the first place. And the point of the offerings was so that we could draw near to God. Living a life of godliness with God among us is the whole point of why we have a tabernacle or a temple in the first place. And this parable makes so much sense to me because this is why both temples were taken away from us as a nation of Israel. Because we weren't using the temple properly. We were making vows based on the temple, saying, I vow upon the altar of the temple, so and so and so and so and so. And then we would break our vows because we would say, oh, look, it's an illegit Ill illegitimate vow. We would go and make our offerings in the temple because we thought maybe it could wash away sins. You say, oh, I've sinned today. I'll just go to the, to the temple tomorrow and quickly give this offering and uh, you know, I'll be clean again to sin again, which is obviously not what the offerings were meant to be. People actually went and made vows on the temple to break the Torah. Right? We studied this. Yeshua takes issue with them about taking vows against looking after their own parents. Where, you know, the Torah tells us one of the main things you've got to do. Honor your father and your mother. It's in the Ten Commandments. People were misusing the temple. And therefore, Hashem took the temple away from us. Because it's just like what Moses is telling the nation this week. That God has given you His word, the Torah. It's called it the Ten Commandments which represents the entire Torah. Like in the parable, the king gives his servants the ten manes, the tr ten treasures, to look after and to do something with it until he returns. If we're not doing the right thing with what God's given us, God says he will take it away. So the people's actions during the first temple era and the second temple era was that they were showing they rejected God and his Torah and they rejected his kingship. Just like it says here in the second parable that Yeshua gives where they rejected this king. And thereby they made themselves enemies of God. Just like in the parable they made themselves enemies of the king. And God destroyed their temple, our temple, and he exiled us into the nations. 
So Moses is telling the children of Israel the same thing in this week's parasha. He's saying, your parents didn't obey the treasure of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the whole Torah, all 613 of them. And that is why I'm warning you, don't make the same mistake. So with the story of Zacchaeus, all the Jews in Jericho, they hated that little tax collector, that mini-me guy, right? That short, that short tax collector. But when Zacchaeus met Yeshua, he completely changed his life. He now wanted to do what the Torah says. And the Torah says that when you wrong a brother with interest or something like that, what Zacchaeus actually had to pay back according to the Torah was just one-fifth in addition to what he took from them. Or if you want to argue that he was a thief, that he stole from them, the Torah says he has to pay back double what he stole from them. But what is it that Zacchaeus pledges to pay back? He says, I will pay back four times what I have wronged these people. Which, by the way, if you look at all the, the laws of paying back in the Torah, this is the highest amount that you pay back. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just keep the law of the Torah. He says that once I've paid back that four times, with whatever wealth I have left over, I'll give half of it to the poor in our community. This is Zacchaeus. That little tax collector that everyone hated changed in an instance just by having Yeshua, meeting Yeshua in his home and having a meal with him. He had a complete change of paradigm, a paradigm shift, a mindset shift. You see, he used to think that his king was Herod and that he'd do everything for Herod. That's why he collected taxes. But his encounter with Yeshua taught him that there is an even greater king. God is king. And if he doesn't keep God's instructions, God's treasure, the Torah, which you look to at how much he's supposed to pay back, then he would have to live a life of curses and be considered the enemy of God. So he realized he needed to change. And he went beyond the letter of the law, even more than what the Torah required. So back to our midgets versus giants idea that I brought up in our our perspective of ourselves and how we view ourselves, either as grasshoppers or as disciples of the king of all kings. Moses is telling the nation in this week's parasha that if they obey God's words, God's Torah, his instructions, even a pikanin, small guy, can overcome giants. Because if you're keeping God's commandments, you're crowning God as your king. And God's kingdom is the greatest kingdom this world will ever know. He is not just any king. He is the king of kings. You see, it's the same message that should resonate with us today. The circumstances that we find ourselves in are mostly out of our control. You can't change them, right? We can't change the reality that we are facing giants in the world right now, especially right now, right? Whether that giant be in the form of job insecurity, mental instability, which is a big thing at the moment, or bills that are piling up that you can't pay because you can't get an income. There's protests that are going to break out like crazy around our country now. These are giants that we actually have no control over because of what's happening in the world. But that doesn't mean that we can't defeat these giants. Because our control is not out there. What we can control is our perception of ourselves and the situation. We have to ask ourselves the question, which king are we serving? Are we serving King Herod? Or are we serving King Hashem, the King of Kings? We are part of God's kingdom. and Therefore, we are destined to enter the promised land. Just like Moses is telling that generation in this week's parasha. Regardless of whether we look like grasshoppers in the bigger context of what the world is challenging, with us, at the, challenging us with at the moment whatever our struggles are that lie ahead of us. So I encourage all of you this week and for the rest of this month to try and make a mind shift. Try and make that paradigm shift like Zacchaeus when we address the difficulties that lie ahead of us. We need to believe in ourselves that we are not just grasshoppers. We need to also believe in our God that He is greater than any challenge this world could ever with us. Because the bigger the obstacle ahead of us is, the bigger amount of glory we give to God when we overcome it 
by putting our faith and trust in Him. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom.